Thank you very much, um, Ambassador and uh, Professor Dominic Correll. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's nice to be back in Ottawa, and uh, I have to start off by saying, first of all, that I'm a graduate of Carleton University, and many, as you know, my father taught there, and in those days, we used to refer to the University of Ottawa as the second university. But, you know, with uh, institutions like the Chair of Ukrainian Studies being here, uh, it's nice to see the stature of the university of this institution really rise up. And uh, in, in, in ex by extension of that, uh, the city of Ottawa and the province too in the country. So congratulations. And I, uh, many familiar faces from the Ukrainian community, many of which I know have worked hard to uh, build the Chair of Ukrainian Studies. Um, the topic is diplomacy, and I can say that uh, as spokesperson for the OSC Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine, one of the things you quickly realize uh, speaking on behalf of 57 participating states, one of which of course is Ukraine, and who uh, vote unanimously is you have to be very, very careful what you say <laughs> most of the time. So uh, if you're waiting for a juicy presentation, you won't get it, but I'll try and give you as much as I can from our observations. Also, um, I brought copies of our latest uh, daily uh, report there in the back there. Um, it's the public version of the report, and you'll get a sense from that of the type of reporting that we do on a daily basis. Uh, also, I would like to uh, pass along uh, heartfelt uh, greetings from our chief monitor, Ambassador Apakan, um, and uh, he, um, he is very grateful to Canada for its strong support of the special monitoring mission. Um, recently, Canada committed 21, 21 more uh, monitors to our mission, which will bring the total number of potential monitors to 24. So that's quite a big commitment from, from Canada. Um, now, we talked about the conflict, and Ambassador Apakan has also been re reiterating his call for an immediate de-escalation to an end to the bloodshed. Uh, in Eastern Ukraine. It's been um, a very, very difficult time in Eastern Ukraine, as most of you know. The, uh, some of the numbers are horrific, costing about 4,000 lives, uh, about 10,000 or more injured. Also, in terms of displacement, IDPs, as we call them, 400,000 people to other regions of Ukraine, and those are only uh, registered IDPs. The real number is much, much higher. The, um, the immense damage that has been caused to the civilian infrastructure, including roads, including bridges, schools, housing, airports, uh, heating, gas, and water facilities is absolutely horrific. Now, a ceasefire, as most of you know, was agreed upon in the Minsk Accords and Protocols of September 5 and 19. Um, and that uh, ceasefire has obviously uh, remained shaky and our, our, you can, by reading your daily, the daily report that is being handed out, you'll get that sense there. Um, and this is happening in a conflict zone equal in size to about half the country of Switzerland. Um, while there has been somewhat of a general calm, the hot spots um, do remain, uh, primarily in Donetsk, in Dabotsive, in Luhansk, and near Mariupol. Um, and in fact, in Mariupol, um, where we thought um, calm would uh, be sustained, it hasn't. The city itself is um, relatively calm, but it's really the areas around that are a real hot spot right now. Um, I also want to tell you that um, our uh, special monitoring mission to Ukraine does serve as a type of early warning facility, if you will. And what we're trying to do in our daily and weekly reports is to better document the scope of the humanitarian crisis and to bring to the attention of the Ukrainian authorities, as well as, of course, international community of the um, uh, immense uh, scope of this humanitarian crisis. Um, as many of you know who have been to that part of the world, cold weather is now on the way. And uh, ten th tens of thousands of IDPs uh, in temporary housing, including many and women or children, face a very, very bleak winter indeed. Um, then there are those who have stayed um, in places like Donetsk and Luhansk and who have been weeks without proper shelter, heating and running water. Uh, the city of Luhansk, for example, um, half of the population has fled. Those that have stayed behind, about 200,000 I believe, um, have been weeks, have been weeks without um, electricity, uh, running water and gas. So, um, and the damage to infrastructure there is very, very bad. And by the way, we had to temporarily leave Luhansk City uh, for safer ground, and now we're about to reestablish our presence there in the city itself, and now that we've been able to find um, uh, proper shelter for, for the monitors there. 
But, uh, and also uh, the mission, as well as me on a personal basis, we uh, think often of the residents in villages like Rasipnoye or Petropavlilka. Now, this is in the area where um, MH17 uh, came down, and um, you know, these people, they had to endure pretty much a double horror of basically uh, the remnants of this Boeing 777 raining down on them. And then now, day after day, they're enduring relentless shelling. Uh, the psychosocial impact on the vulnerable, especially women and children, is absolutely incalculable. Uh, the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission to Ukraine was created in March of this year out of the unanimous decision of 57 participating states, including uh, the Russian Federation, including Ukraine, Canada, and the USA. In fact, uh, Canada played um, quite a big role in the drafting of our mandate. Um, we are there at the invitation of the Ukrainian government and are now in the process of doubling the size of the mission to 500 international monitors. Um, right now we're at about 270 uh, monitors and of the um, new inductees, about two-thirds will be deployed to eastern Ukraine. Um, and our monitors, by the way, represent more than 40 participating states. Uh, many have uh, Russian uh, language skills and experience in military, law enforcement, human rights, ceasefire monitoring. Um, and then our mandate was recently extended uh, by unanimous vote uh, to the end of uh, March uh, 2015. So what exactly are we doing in Ukraine? Well, after the um, tumultuous events of late 2013 and early 2014, the mission came to Ukraine with the um, aim of reducing tensions and fostering peace, stability, and security with impartiality and with transparency. We monitor, we establish the facts, and we re report on the general security situation in response to specific incidents or reports of incidents. Um, again, I mentioned the daily report. I'm sure many of you already subscribe to them. We also have weekly reports and we have spot reports. Um, we are also uh, in, the in the process of producing another thematic report. We did one earlier on IDPs and now we're doing one on the new media landscape uh, in, in Ukraine because there has been, uh, you know, in the past few months, uh, shifting sands in terms of media ownership and consumption. And of course, um, we have to also examine what's been happening with media um, in the eastern parts of the country. Um, we are there to, in Ukraine to help facilitate dialogue on the ground in order to reduce tensions and promote normalization of the situation. We are also there to help facilitate access. Um, the efforts of Ambassador Apakon especially and supplemented by negotiations of the Trilateral Contact Group, which by the way includes senior representatives of the Russian Federation, Ukraine and the OSCE Swiss Chair in Office, went a long way to facilitate um, the access of emergency workers, first responders, and experts to the crash site of MH17. Um, the special monitoring mission, we were the first international presence at the crash site just 24 hours after the plane came down. And um, I uh, get asked many times of you know, what it was like personally to, to be there and for all of our colleagues to be there. And I can tell you that, um, you know, when, just as a side, when we first arrived, the, it was a horrific scene and um, with the plane still smoldering and uh, with very little security perimeter. Um, and it took quite some time for the proper um, experts to arrive to, to get there and to get the effort going. But I'm happy to report that um, many of the, most of the uh, human remains have been uh, collected. Uh, most of the passengers, almost 300, have been identified. Um, a lot of the personal belongings have been collected, including in two separate missions that was escorted by our special monitoring mission. And now the next step you will see is the um, collection of the remainder of the personal belongings, the uh, removal of the debris, which is a very, very big effort, and then um, continuation of the criminal investigation. Um, when the came, plane came down, many of you may have remembered me being quoted as saying it's one of the biggest open crime scenes in the world. And uh, just to wrap that part of it up, um, for me personally, it was a, especially um, uh, an unbelievable um, type of uh, hit, if you will, because um, not only of my Ukrainian roots, but also uh, many of you know I've lived in Malaysia for quite some time. I have many friends there. I know the airline very well. It was an unbelievable scene to arrive there and see a Malaysian Airlines plane on Ukrainian soil. 
Um, anyway, going back to the um, uh, general um, situation, we also, going back to our facilitation of access and dialogue, we also um, play quite a big role in um, facilitation of dialogue in cities like Odessa. Uh, we convene roundtables there regularly to bring together members of civil society, journalists, law enforcement, and others in order to help maintain peace and stability. And this is especially important, of course, after the events there of May. Um, recently, um, our ability to monitor the general security situation in Ukraine was enhanced by the arrival of a fleet of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, also known as drones. Um, and uh, these are provided by a company in Austria called Schiebel, and uh, they're equipped actually with a very high-tech camera uh, manufactured here in Canada. Um, they were, they are going to be based in, uh, near Mariupol and with a range of about 100 kilometers, they have the potential to monitor all the way up to the border with Russia as well as quite deep into the uh, conflict zone. Um, and uh, through the um, generous assistance of member states such as Canada, we're now in the process of growing our fleet of um, armored vehicles in eastern Ukraine from about 17, 17 to 90. And this is very, very crucial. I talked about the, um, earlier about the expansion of the mission. We're unable to expand the mission in eastern Ukraine unless we, we have these armored vehicles. They're crucial to our operations on the ground there. Um, I know there's going to be a session uh, on the elections, but I just wanted to say a few words about that. Um, as most of you know, we had these, our, our sister institu institutional DEER monitor the elections, but we did uh, monitor the general kind of election infrastructure. Um, and um, what, uh, what oh DEER Phil did this year was one of its biggest missions with about three, uh, sorry, with about 800 long-term and short-term observers. Um, the election was uh, conducted uh, with only minor regularities, and for sure it marked an important step forward in Ukraine's aspirations uh, to consolidate democratic elections in line with its international commitments. We can report that in most parts of the country, election day proceeded calmly with few disturbances. Uh, misuse of administrative resources was not named by ODIR as an issue of major concern, unlike, of course, in previous elections. Um, however, of course, out of 32 polling stations, in Luhansk and Donetsk, only 17 were fully um, or partially operational. And of course, in the conflict zone itself, no uh, voting took place. Um, there, were there, there were very many positive points that the International Election Observation Mission under ODIR can highlight from the process, including um, an impartial and efficient Central Election Commi Commission, CIVICA, uh, an amply contested election that offered voters real choice, and general respect for fundamental freedoms. It's also, of course, important to remind everyone that the election was held in very um, unusual circumstances during the times of a crisis when the uh, political and security environment um, uh, is not what one would expect at the moment. Um, now, also, um, I mentioned media earlier, but there were also concerns raised during the election about media coverage um, and uh, by coverage by outlets, by mainstream outlets that are owned or controlled by political or corporate interests. So um, to, to wrap up um, in terms of uh, the way forward, um, what uh, of course we don't want to see happen in the eastern part of the Ukraine, Ukraine is the, uh, this frozen conflict uh, or the creation of a frozen conflict with, which drags on, costs more lives and disrupts more livelihoods. Um, there's also um, talk now of a so-called whether we're getting close to what some people are calling a moment of truth moment, uh, moment of truth point, where um, you know whether there'll be further escalation or de-escalation. And again, as our daily report gives you a sense, um, we are seeing seeing quite uh, daily uh, heavy shelling. And uh, one thing we are not seeing is the um, removal of uh, heavy military equipment from either side, which of course was one of the um, provisions of the Minsk uh, protocols. Um, and also, um, I can say that throughout this whole process, since the mission arrived in Ukraine, um, among the, the many things we've been looking for and um, having dialogue with the government is the um, further push towards decentralization. It's very, very important. Uh, the battle to end corruption, which is still very endemic and entrenched, 
and uh, of course more efforts uh, to be put into dialogue and reconciliation. And you'll remember that um, earlier this year there were, I believe, three national roundtables where different uh, uh, civil society politicians came together to um, discuss the way forward in Ukraine. And uh, this is a process that we monitored and one which we think uh, should continue. Very finally, um, you talked about diplomatic successes, and I just wanted to highlight uh, again the efforts of the so-called trilateral contact group. Again, this is a um, unique kind of formation that involves uh, senior representatives from the Russian Federation, the Ukrainian side, uh, the, the, our Swiss chair in office, and um, we help them facilitate the dialogue with the rebel side. The um, Trilateral Contract Group uh, operates under a concept of silent diplomacy, so it's a closed door um, kind of uh, discussion, and um, it continues to this day. I think uh, they're planning another um, session uh, in the next few days. But um, that Trilateral Contract Group actually was in session um, at around the exact time the Malaysian Airlines plane came down, and I can tell you that they played a very, very big role in terms of uh, establishing our access to get there 24 hours later. So there are some diplomatic successes in groups like that. Thank you. Thank you.